Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's really a thrill for me to be here I, representing the Michigan State University Food Security Group. We have a group of about 24 faculty who focus on food security issues globally, especially in Africa and Asia. Uh, I'm a co-director of the Food Security Group with Eric Crawford, who manages the BeHerd project. So we're able to put the uh, policy system capacity building and the human capacity building together. And uh, I'm also the project director for the Food Security Policy Innovation Lab. Uh, it's been really exciting for me to be here uh, because my own background is actually in agricultural technology. Uh, I started off life as a farm management economist in the National Agricultural Research System. And uh, after I graduated from Michigan State, I worked with uh, ICRASAT for a while. And uh, it, nothing excites me more than seeing how these different pieces uh, fit together uh, in the scaling up uh, technology. Uh, so uh, I, I want to just introduce today's session. Um, first of all, though, uh, I want to just link this back uh, to Johannes Lin's presentation, his framing about scaling up. Uh, and in fact, Samber actually did this. He, he made a comment about you know, when we think about scaling up and we think about the different dimensions, there was the horizontal dimension, the, the geographical scaling up. There was the functional dimension of scaling up, adding new components to uh, innovative programs. And then there was the vertical scaling up, making changes in policies and institutions that allow powerful innovative agricultural technologies to be mainstreamed into agricultural development processes. And so uh, when we start looking at input policies and how they can facilitate scaling up, we're talking about this vertical dimension of scaling up. So that's how this kind of links into the broader framework that we started off with in day one. Uh, for those of you who, who like uh, formal definitions, I, I think the general counsel would like this one. Uh, policy consists of laws, treaties, regulations, statements, administrative actions, and funding priorities. And then you pause and take a drink and go on. Policy includes the approaches, implementation processes, and activities that guide government actions and enforcement. So when somebody asks you to define policy, you'll have this uh, to look up, and you can use it. But I think it's kind of easier to get your minds around it when you think of it as rules of the game that establish who can do what and subject to what conditions. Uh, in the previous section, one of our private sector partners was talking about uh, how uh, they need to have flexibility to operate. And if there's restrictions, then they hesitate to dive in. And so these rules of the game that establish whether or not companies have that kind of flexibility are really critical. So why do input policies matter? Well, input matters, policies matter if they drive up costs or risks for the end, of, end user. And we, we can think about two types of, of problems. We can think about areas of commission. Uh, these may be uh, poor policies, disenabling, disempowering policies, or uh, they can simply be uh, poor implementation or failure to implement good policies that could uh, that end up driving up costs in the input supply chain. And I'll come to why this is important in a second. And then you have areas of omission, which is the, the lack of enabling policies uh, or the, the lack of implementation of those enabling policies that can drive down costs in the input supply chain. And uh, during the previous session, Aline was talking about why one of the, the major struggles that the input sector has is this very concentrated sales period. You only get one or two uh, sales periods a year, and then there's a very long uh, production to market cycle. Uh, and so these, this, these two characteristics of the input subsectors expose private sector companies to considerable risk and they don't need uh, anything uh, making the situation worse for them. So I want to uh, come to this uh, issue of um, uh, where uh, the, these increased costs cause problems. Um, 
at the end of the day, what uh, drives scaling up, and this was very clear in Luis Pereira's soybean presentation. I, I just loved his presentation. That was such an exciting example for a, a country that has struggled so long to see this kind of transformation happen. But profitability is at the core. Profitability uh, for the producer, uh, and of course, profitability for the producer is essential to drive profitability for the other actors. So we have on this graph on the left, you've got revenues, costs, and net returns. Obviously, that's a very simple uh, understanding about uh, where these profits come from. I'm not going to go through this diagram. Uh, when you get access to the uh, PowerPoint, you'll see that there's a series of notes that explain these PowerPoints in more detail, so they can be quite helpful to you. They can also be helpful if you ever have to do a cost-benefit analysis, because uh, these, this kind of calculation is really at the core of cost-benefit analysis for, uh, for scaling up. But what I really wanted to point out here was that when we talk about uh, poor policies that end up driving up the cost of supply of inputs, that always, sooner or later, feeds into higher costs for the user, diminishes profitability for the user, discourages the user for adopting. And although today our focus is um, uh, on the uh, input side, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact uh, that uh, output market policies are also important for uh, incentives for scaling up. And the side on the green there are where policies can affect um, the, the profitability for adopters on the revenue side. As I said, I'm not going to go into big details here, but, but policies uh, drive up costs if they're poor, drive down costs if they're good. They reduce uh, revenues and profitability on the output market side if they're poor. They increase revenue on the output side if, they, if they're good. And, it, and it's, it's not just, of course, having good policies, but having them implemented effectively. So now we move on to saying, well, what do we mean by a successful, what do we mean by an effective input policy? And uh, this is a, a definition uh, that was come up with by a steering committee for a, an input technical convening that will be held in the next few days. Uh, David Atwood, I think, has a lot of credit for this. Successful policies lead ultimately to significantly greater numbers of smallholder farmers benefiting in visible ways from access to and use of high quality seed and fertilizer in ways that maximize the, income, the impact of scarce government resources and maximize the use of the private sector for purposes of sustainability, innovation, and saving government resources. So I just want to highlight a couple of uh, kind of criteria or uh, attributes of this definition that are relevant to our discussion today. The first one, of course, is greater numbers. Uh, scaling up is all about greater numbers when you're talking about smallholder farmers. Um, the other aspect is uh, for these smallholder farmers to benefit in very visible ways. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important to get politicians on board. If, if the benefits are not visible, um, then politicians can't take credit for them. And if they can't take credit for them, it doesn't really enter into their objective function uh, in democracies. So it's important that these be highly visible. And of course, USAID, I think, does a very good job of, of uh, you know, showcasing its successes. And this is a, it's a very important thing to do. The other attribute of this is, is maximizing the impact of scarce government resources and maximizing the use of private sector. And the, those two things are really, they're not separate. They are two sides of the same coin. Because the more efficiently and the more productively the private sector can be engaged, the less uh, public expenditure is needed from the government side. Or, put it this way, the more government resources can be allocated from things that the private sector can do to things that only the public sector can do. So if the private sector is able to do its job really well, that means that more resources are available for essential public functions like agricultural research, agricultural extension, infrastructure, and so on. So I want to just uh, 
focus now on the, on the first two of the questions that were up on the list that the introduction Ed gave to this uh, session, which is identifying input policy constraints. I think it was referred to as substantive policy constraints. How do you know if there is a substantive policy constraint? And I think one way to approach this is to realize that a seed and fertilizer are value chains in their own right. They're, they're obviously inputs to a much bigger value chain, but they have their own value chains in the sense that they involve a series of activities such as importing and exporting, uh, manufacture or multiplication indicated seed, they require quality control, they involve registration and licensing of different participants, they involve distribution systems. And so you can ask for each stage in this input value chain, are the policies and regulations clear in terms of the roles and responsibilities of different actors? Very often, our policies are not clear. They may not even be known. Are they constructive? Do they actually help the sector perform better? And are they implementable at reasonable cost for all players? And then a second question is, do the players have the capacity and the incentives to implement these policies at reasonable cost? And that means, do they have the capacity and incentives to comply uh, if they are an agent that's being regulated, or do they have the incentives and capacity to enforce if they're on the regulatory side? So those are a series of questions that you can ask in relation to a specific scaling up program to see whether you have an input sector constraint. The second thing then is, are there constraints in the system and uh, in a sense, uh, I've made an artificial dichotomy between distinguishing between these substantive constraints and then the system in which those constraints uh, are resolved, because in a sense, you actually need a policy system to be able to effectively identify those constraints, because you really need a, a stakeholder group that brings together the, the private sector, and the private sector is large, it's highly diverse, there's a lot of different components to that, so that there isn't a private sector representative, there'll be several. And then the public sector, obviously, and then there'll also be technical services that, that need to be called upon. And so this group needs to be inclusive in the sense that you need to have all these different uh, sources of expertise and interest represented. And uh, if they are, it can be a very effective mechanism to answering the first question. It, obviously, it has to be transparent. The same information needs to be available to all participants. Uh, otherwise, if it's not, then you can have deals under the table and some groups can get marginalized. Uh, the objectives of the policy need to be clear. Uh, probably 80% uh, of problems or arguments about what is the right kind of policy uh, derive from the fact that we're not clear about what the policy is trying to achieve or different groups want the policy to achieve different things. And of course, every time you want a policy to achieve something different, then you need a different instrument to do it. You have to have as many policy instruments as you have policy, you have policy objectives. Uh, so uh, that's why, for example, if you think about sort of fertilizer promotion activities, uh, you can't kind of minimize uh, the cost of access for the poorest producers and have a highly prof profitable value chain for, for marketers. Uh, trying to address those different objectives requires different policies. It's very important in these groups that the discussions are evidence-based. If there isn't evidence, then it's difficult to diagnose constraints in the first place. And then it's absolutely critical to try to prioritize what these problems are. It's very difficult to attack all the problems at once. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, your CID folks understand that better than anybody, how you really have to be very focused to get something changed within the, with the system. And so focusing on the priority constraints is critical because of the, the energy that's required to get change. And then of course, the actual group has to be effective in being able to implement those changes. Very, sometimes you can get a change in a policy, you can get a change in a regulation, but then there isn't then a follow through to implementation of the new policy. And that may require some capacity building to get that done. 
And then finally, there has to be a, a system for mutual accountability. In other words, if you have a prioritized policy agenda, and then you develop a program to change and implement a new policy, then there has to be a kind of regular review by the participants. Are we actually getting there? So with, with these last two slides, I hope that will kind of provide an introduction to the first piece of group work. Thank you very much. Thank you.